Hey, Vince McMahon, it's time for this week's Stick to Wrestling podcast. Oh, no, give me a break. Oh, brother. Another edition of the Stick to Wrestling podcast. My name is John McAdam. This is Stick to Wrestling. It is a classic pro wrestling show, generally dealing with wrestling from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. If you give us 60 minutes, perhaps indeed, we'll give you a wicked good and raw bone podcast. I want to invite you to join our Facebook group. All you have to do is, is search Stick to Wrestling, and it'll come right up. You'll be invited in. Good times are had by all. We, As a matter of fact, this show is going to be based on questions from, the, from that Facebook group. You can also follow me on Twitter. Uh, just search John McAdam and, and follow the guy with the Stick to Wrestling logo as his avatar. I don't always stick to wrestling. I talk a little bit of baseball. Uh, rest in peace. Sal Bando. He was a great third baseman for some legendary Oakland A's teams. Here's something you might, might not know, but you would if you follow me on Twitter or were part of the Facebook group. In 1976, we're not sticking to wrestling here, so I'll be brief. In 1976, the Red Sox bought Joe Rudy and Raleigh Fingers from the A's, and the Yankees bought Vita Blue from the uh, from the A's. Sal Banda was going to be next. He was going to be sold to Detroit, and Gene Tennis was going to be next after that. And who knows who's going to be after that? So, little tidbit for you there. And let me see. I want to bring on. All right, my co-host here, Steve Generelli. Steve, thank you for coming on. Well, thank you for having me, John. And that's a baseball trivia I was unaware of. I knew about Vita Blue to the Yankees. I knew about uh, the guys to the Red Sox, but I didn't know about the uh, guys going to Detroit. That's very interesting. No, uh, Gene Tennis, there were multiple teams uh, discussing him, and they were finalizing uh, Sal Bando to the Detroit Tigers. No idea what Detroit was going to do with him because Detroit was terrible in 1976. But anyway, might be time for us to stick to wrestling. Steve, we had, in my opinion, in, in my humble opinion, one of the best stick to wrestling episodes ever last week i'm talking top five it was you know we had a lot of great reviews on it a lot of great feedback and the episode went what like almost two hours so we're going to continue to harp on that ladies and gentlemen talking about larry zabisco and the wwf from 1980 but i mean i i feel like i have a lot of cool stuff for you guys um larry zabisco in the Pro Wrestling Torch, this is like 30 years ago. I want to say like 89 or 90, uh, when he was between his uh, WCW runs, did a an interview for the Pro Wrestling Torch by Wade Keller, which I think is a very underrated newsletter and website. And Larry Zabisco told a story where you would have a guy come in kind of new to the WWF, usually an undercard guy who got beat up on TV, maybe, you know, was one of the opening matches on the spot shows or maybe even on the big shows, like, you know, guy who works the opener at the Spectrum. And Larry said that Vince McMahon Sr. would walk up to these guys and he'd be like, how are you doing? Could you use some extra money? And he'd offer them like, you know, two or three twenties, right? Which was a lot of money back late seventies, early eighties. Steve, if you took that money, you were gone. Oh, really? I've never heard this before. You were gone. And I was like, you know, I've heard crazier stuff go on in pro wrestling. So then I ask a guy who fits the description of the wrestlers I just talked about. And I asked him, hey, is that story true? And he's like, yeah, totally true. But there was a reason for it. That reason was that if the guys liked you, you were new to the WWF, been there for a few weeks, if they liked you, they wised you up. They said, if Vince McMahon Sr. offers you money, you say no. And if they didn't like you enough to tell you that, it spoke to Vince Sr. He is like, hey, get rid of this guy. If either the wrestlers don't like him enough to give him this advice or if he's dumb enough to ignore it. Did you enjoy that anecdote, Steve? <laughs> well, it, it, it reminded me of a job I used to work on, but that's a long story. Uh, as far as a wrestling story that that reminds me of, uh, I, I do know that Gino Hernandez had this very, very brief run in the WWF. 
And, mm-hmm. uh, and this is a story that uh, Davey O'Hannon had told on a, a website. Uh, and basically, you know, he came into the dressing room kind of bragging like he was the U.S. champion from Detroit and he was acting like he was the next big thing. And he's in the, he's in the dressing room with Bruno and and mm-hmm. uh, it's a Kluna and all the old school WWF guys. And, and he's like 20 years old. Yeah, he's like 20 years old. And, and basically he's acting like he's the next big thing. And, and and so basically, you know, within a short amount of time, you know, that he wasn't asked back. And and yeah. that was the thing. He was great in the ring. I mean, he put on a great show and had a great look, but he just was going to fit in in that in that uh, promotion. Uh, you know what? And I I get that. I probably would not have done well in a pro wrestling dressing room when I was nineteen, twenty years old. You know, coming off the, the his big push in Detroit, uh, his big push in Dallas, his medium push in Portland. I mean. I, and, you know, knowing what we know about Gino, I totally believe that story that he just pissed everyone off and they just said, all right, see you later. Yeah. And, and I think WWF and AWA, those were more veteran locker rooms. And, you know, you just you just had to kind of behave a certain way. I guess there was a pecking order, so to speak, and you didn't want to offend uh, these guys who had been there for many, many years. If you were a younger guy, it was like, you know, sit down, shut up and maybe you'll learn something. Exactly. I mean, uh, since I have, I mean, my understanding from from the beginning was dressing room etiquette. If you're the new guy, quietly go over, shake everyone's hand, even even if you are a big big name coming in from another territory. Okay, if you're Mil Moscaris, if you're a superstar, Billy Graham. That is how you walk in. You you shake everyone's hand very quietly. Nice to meet you, and then you sit down and you shut up. Right, right. And the story you told uh, Larry had said uh, that that's really kind of telling about uh, Vince Sr., the older McMahon. And um, did he elaborate anything more about uh, the the time we're talking about or like 1980 or anything like that? Uh, No, actually, Zabisco like didn't give the reasoning for it. He was just like, hey, here's the way it was in the WWF. And when I asked this other guy who was an underneath guy, he was like, oh, yeah, but here's why it happened. So it was like, I want to say a good 10 years before I heard the story and then find found out what the the mindset behind it was. Wow. Yeah, well. You know, I, I guess uh, there were probably a lot of suckers that wanted the quick 40 bucks. You know? Oh, I, I mean, you know, the promoter takes you aside. Hey, you doing OK? Yeah, have a meal on me. Don't worry. Like, Oh, thank you, sir. It's like, but that's not what he was looking for. Absolutely. All right. So, I, all, by the way, I want to thank Dr. Nicholas Coliatis for for his contribution last week, Steve, I think he really added another uh, dimension to what we were doing. Yeah, he he really uh, did help the show. I mean, as as we mentioned back then, uh, you know, you and I had lived through it all. We had seen it, and we knew the before and the after and everything. But uh, you know, here he is. He's a longtime fan, but he's seeing this. He had seen the match before, but he's seeing the whole entire story for the very first time. It was thanks to your archival footage and uh, or archival audio. And he he did add a lot. He 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 brought a, a new pair of eyes to the proceedings. You know, we're going back over thirty years. I used to manage a store at the Pheasant Lane Mall, a small store. Don't you know? It wasn't like Walmart or anything. And we had a new district manager, and he comes in. And he's like, "What's that on the wall?" And there was a little white spot against a blue background that had been there since I had walked in the door, but he was the fresh set of eyes who was like, hey, you got to take care of that. And we put a poster over it, but a fresh set of eyes, it's always a good thing. Larry Zabisco put out a book, I want to say 10, 15 years ago, and I'm at Barnes & Noble or wherever. I'm like, wow, Larry Larry Zabisco has a book out. That would, Wrestler number 2000 now have, a, <laughs> have an autobiography. I mean, Steve, you remember back in the day, there were only like a handful of autobiographies. There was uh, Dynamite Kids. There was Luthez, if you could get your hands on it, maybe a couple of others. And then Mick Foley's book comes out. 
And it's a it's a sensation. It was the number one book on, on the New York Times bestseller list. And then literally, I mean, there, there was just a, such a flood of wrestling books after that that I couldn't possibly keep up. I mean, I'm sure you remember. Oh, I, I, I do. And and I live in Tampa and I still do. And uh, there there was a big Borders bookstore in the area that I live in. Uh, well, back then it was Carrollwood. Uh, Borders is long gone, as I'm sure most of the listeners know. But I remember being there in the sports section looking at uh, the latest book from Missing Link or maybe the latest book from Larry <laughs> Zabisco. Uh, and, there, and there was Edge. Edge uh, Adam Copeland uh, was right in there. He was looking at the wrestling books, too, with me. And uh, he lives in Tampa or did back then. It just, it just it, the wrestling books went hog wild. Um, Larry's was one I never really bought. I think maybe, I, you know, in those, in those olden days at Barnes and Nobles, maybe I spread out with a book in my lap and maybe I just kind of went through it for about uh, 30 minutes and kind of read it on the, on the fast. But, um, uh, you know, it, Larry, Larry definitely has some good stories to tell uh, that I would agree with. Well, if we're, well, first of all, I mean, I don't know about any more. No, probably not. But back in the day, like most of the wrestlers lived in Tampa, cheap flights. You can get anywhere from there. But secondly, I, I picked up Larry's book and I started thumbing through it. And I, like Larry said last week on the audio, I don't hate Bruno. I don't hate I don't hate Larry Zabisco. In fact, I like Larry Zabisco. But I started thumbing through this book, and I mean you want to talk about a work of fiction, man. <laughs> I mean I don't remember the specifics because it was a long time ago, but it was like, oh my, come on. You know, like anyone's gonna believe that. I know better. But one thing that, that, that stood out in the book, and it was something Larry claimed in that Torch interview, Larry said he got blackballed after he refused to go out and wrestle at Shea Stadium until he got paid what he thought he was supposed to get paid. He felt like Vince Sr. was lowballing him, and Larry's like, I'm not going out there with you know unless you give me the money I want. And supposedly Vince McMahon Sr., blackballed him over that now i heard that story for the first time 30 something years ago and i never i uh, up until recently i did not believe it and i'll tell you why steve larry zabisco had main events in the philadelphia spectrum against bob backland in october and november of 1980 now if vince senior was really going to blackball him someone explained these main events to me right right I don't, so I now believe Larry Zabisco was blackballed because, A, he worked very sparingly in 1981 and 1982. He had a All Japan tour. And by the way, Vince McMahon is friendly with New Japan. So that makes sense. And it, it was just weird. Zabisco, like he wasn't wrestling for two years. And then he shows up on Georgia Championship Wrestling. Now, at the time, I figured he was just sitting at home until he came back to the WWF to, go, to wrestle Bob Backlund again, which was a, a reasonable assumption at the time. But no, that's that he never came back to the WWF. And at the time, Georgia was hiring guys who had previously been blackballed for working for Poffo. They brought in Pez Whatley, who hadn't had a real job in forever. They brought in Ronnie Garvin, who couldn't get booked outside of Knoxville or Lexington in forever. Bob Roop, same thing. Bill Watts brought him in a year earlier. But, you know, Ole was giving work to blackballed guys. And this is after... Vince McMahon, uh, the WWF, hired the Samoans and Don Morocco after they walked out of Georgia with no notice. So it wouldn't surprise me if Ole just said, all right, well, if you're going to do that, I'm no longer on your blackball list. I'll hire whoever I want. Anyway, with, with Larry, I think just because the Bruno uh, Larry thing was like box office off the charts and setting records and everything in the Northeast, I don't think because of that, I don't think you have to assume Larry was a made man. Larry was a going to be an international star. I mean, you, you have to remember that this was still the days of regional wrestling. This mm -hmm. wasn't national expansion wrestling where, hey, you know, they're big in the garden. They're going to go to L.A. They're going to go to Chicago all over the place. I mean, we were just strictly the Northeast in those days. Uh, you know, a lot of big buildings, maybe the biggest markets and everything. But it, it didn't make Larry an internationally known name. 
And, and I think the way the other promotions were back then, everything was so insulated. It, I mean, the WWF was its own thing. Florida was its own thing. AWA, we, whatever promotion we're talking about, it wasn't like, you know, the fans in Florida knew that, like, God, Larry Zabisco is his hot heel. We want him down here or, or you know, we want Bruno down here. It, it, it didn't work that way. Everything was so insulated. So I can kind of uh, sympathize with Larry Zabisco. He's kind of like definitely come out of his shell. He's definitely proved he can draw big gates. But, you know, it, it, the reason why, I, I mean, looking back on it now is because, the fans believed in this real relationship he had with Bruno that was built up for seven or eight years. They saw the soap opera of the, you know, I just need a match against you. And Bruno saying, no, I don't want to wrestle you. You're my brother. I don't want to hurt you. And so the fans got in the Northeast bought in all this because they, they really believed it. And it was a story that was believable because there was a lot of truth involved in it. But just to, to kind of make this assumption of, well, now that Larry's big here, he's going to be big everywhere. That's kind of a real big uh, leap of faith, in my opinion. Uh, I agree with you. And you know what? On the Facebook group, I actually said I was going to talk a little bit more about, you know, because someone asked, where was Larry Zabisco between the end of his WWF run and the beginning of his Georgia run? We're missing two full calendar years here. And I was like, okay, well, Zabisco had two Japan tours, one in 81, one in 82. But the other times, he was wrestling this independent that was run at least out this way by Killer Kowalski. It was called the International Wrestling Federation. And I went to a show right here in Nashua, New Hampshire on a Saturday night, and they were pushing it hard on TV. Main event, Larry Zbysko against David Sammartino. And we went to this show. Now, Steve, mind you, I had, I had never been to a wrestling show that did not draw – a large number of fans. And my friends and I were, were excited. We got front row seats. Our first ever front row seats were pro wrestling. <laughs> well, guess what? Everyone had a front row seat because they couldn't even fill up the front row. There were literally about 40 people there. I was taken aback by the whole thing. I mean, here is Larry Zabisco against Bruno's kid, and it cannot draw flies to a pile of you know what. Yeah, I, I mean... With with Vince uh, and all the other promoters, I mean, uh, like the wrestlers like to crap on the promoters and say, "Hey, you know, they're just stealing money from me." But the the promoters put up the the money. They they found big buildings. They had good advertising. They knew how to pack the crowds. And when you're dealing with Kowalski and a you know a no name promotion, that's a just a startup. I can see why that failed, and it's just a shame that um, poor Zabisco was floundering at that point of his career. Yeah, I mean, it, it was this show was on Channel 25 on Sunday mornings, and the best way I could describe the show, sometimes it was on and sometimes it wasn't. It was that simple. Sometimes you'd look, it's 11.05, okay, I guess there's no wrestling this week. They're showing, they're still showing that movie, and then the next week it would just be on again. Um, so that might explain some of it. And you're right, it was a new promotion. Before I get rolling on these questions, Steve, I mean, I think you and I were in the same boat. When I first started watching wrestling in 1976, the top heel stars were Ernie Ladd, superstar Billy Graham, Ivan Koloff. And then as time went on, they were replaced by Stan Hansen, Bruiser Brody, Nikolai Volkov. Like these guys were now here and Graham, Hansen, Ladd were all gone. And I'm... 10 years old, 11 years old. I'm like, what is, where, do, where do superstar Billy Graham and Ivan Koloff go? And where did Stan Hansen and Bruiser Brody come from? <laughs> and then I started getting magazines and the, the it answered my question. But you're right. It, you know, the WWF, it lived in its own little fishbowl. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, not to repeat myself, but it, it just seemed like just the fact that Larry was a big deal now after the Bruno feud, it wasn't like people were clamoring for him. I mean, he had been to Florida two or three years prior to the Bruno feud, and uh, he was like a middle of the card guy. He would worked in other territories. I think he worked in Mid Atlantic, Carolinas briefly. too. Yeah, Carolinas, and you know, it, it was it wasn't like all of a sudden because he was a heel now that people wanted him or promotions wanted him. 
and whether he was blackballed or not, I, I think part of it is, you know, he just became difficult. I think from from a promoter's standpoint, I think they felt he was difficult to deal with. Um, you know, w- w- all the years that Bruno was with the McMahons, uh, Bruno could say, hey, uh, you know, this young kid, J.J. Dillon, who's a referee, you know, he he did a blade job and we got to pay him an extra $150. And Bruno had that cachet where he could tell Vince, the elder Vince, hey, we got to take care of this guy or that guy that didn't get paid enough. But now Larry is all of a sudden 26 years old, and he's now wielding the power and saying, "Hey, uh, you got to pay me this. You got to pay me this in cash." And you know, he's he's getting all this uh, money for these these house shows. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure the uh, both of the McMahons and the supposedly uh, young Vince uh, called Zabisco on the phone saying, "You're giving my father a heart attack," and uh, supposedly that was <laughs> what he said. And he he didn't want to, you know, you know, Larry Larry was. Uh, feeling his wild oats, I guess, and he was, you know, reveling in all this this money he was making. But, you know, you gotta you gotta play ball with the promotion too. You can't have it both ways. Uh, I I agree with what you're saying. You know, let me interweave a question into this conversation. Connor McGrath asked. Was Vince McMahon Sr. really powerful enough to get Larry Zbysko essentially blackballed for a few years after his WWF run? Or do you think there's another reason where his career sputtered sputtered between his WWF and Georgia runs? Well, first of all, to answer the question, yes, he was. He absolutely was. And the way the promoters played the game, and Steve, I'm I'm sure you know this, is, you you know, the promoter would say to the wrestler, look, you're not just going to cross me and go work for Georgia, Florida, and never come back here again. You cross me, you're not working anywhere again. And, I mean, the same thing happened to a couple of different guys, like when uh, Spike Huber got into into a divorce with Dick the Bruiser's daughter. I mean, no one was using Spike Huber after that. So (laughs) if Dick the Bruiser could get that done, certainly Vince McMahon Sr. could could get it done. Steve, I just said I believe Larry was blackball, but then, well, then he worked the spectrum. I think what happened, and we're, I want to mention too, Steve, I'm sure you remember this, August 8th, 1980, before the Shea Stadium show, they run championship wrestling on Channel 9. Uh, they ran it early in the afternoon, you know, just in case you were going to Shea, you weren't going to be home by midnight, presumably. And they they had been running an angle where Tony Gurria had returned to the WWF and he just wanted to talk to his longtime friend and tag team partner, Larry Zbysko and Larry Zbysko wasn't having it. And then on August 8th, on that earlier run show, Korea comes out again, Larry, I just want to talk to you. And, and Larry's had it. He lets Tony have it. He puts the boots to him. Bruno comes out from his commentator spot and he's like, you know, Tony, are you okay? And Tony's like tonight, Bruno, I want you to kick the ever-loving hell out of him or whatever he said. <laughs> and so now, the next month, we've got Larry Zbysko and Tony Gurria at Madison Square Garden. And the following month, we get the two of them in, in the Texas death match. I guess my long-winded way of trying to explain what I think, I think Vince McMahon Sr. said, all right, Larry, you can have your way at Shea Stadium, and I'm not just going to kick you out right away. I'm going to get what I can get out of you, which is a two-match uh, feud with Tony Gurria at Madison Square Garden, which is the uh, the matches against Bob Backlund at, at the Spectrum, you know, the Intercontinental Championship matches against Pedro Morales. You know, I'm not just going to let this guy go. I've built up this commodity. And then when he's done here, he's done. That's my new theory. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I will say this to get put a little personal perspective on this, and I, I looked this up on the history of WWE dot com. I, I actually attended a show in my hometown, Binghamton, New York, July twenty fifth, nineteen eighty, which is roughly about two weeks before Shea Stadium occurred. And on that card, uh, on the undercard, we got to see Andre the Giant defeat Hulk Hogan. That was the last match of the night. I remember that. And the main event, which was right in the middle of the card, was Bob Backlund against Larry Zbysko. It says on the website that Backlund won via countout. I can't really remember that, but I do remember Larry bloodied him up. And uh, this particular show, and this is about the fourth year of me attending live shows, this had one of the biggest crowds that we had seen, uh, probably three or 4,000 fans in Binghamton. And 
this match was one of the best of the Backlund matches I'd ever seen. I've seen Backlund against uh, pretty much a who's who of wrestling against uh, Luke Graham, Stasiak, Valentine, <laughs> Maivia. I mean, it goes on and on, but Sabisco really paired up with him well. And I mean, both of them were very comparable bills. They um, did a lot of good chain wrestling in the match. I mean, they were so similar in size that when they did brawl, it was very uh, interesting. You didn't know who was going to get the edge on the other. And there was so much heat on Zabisco because of the Bruno feud. Uh, uh, they had two matches back and forth in Binghamton. There was one the month prior. But, uh, you know, as being there in person, um, until Roddy Piper arrived in 1984, I'd say Larry Zabisco was probably the hottest heel I had ever seen up to that time. You, I mean, I seen Billy Graham in his heyday, and he was really over big time, but he didn't really give you much in the ring. I mean, he just, uh, I guess in a smaller town like Binghamton, he kind of phoned it in. But Zabis oh, yeah. Zabisco really um, gave us our money's worth that night. I mean, that's, that's a great anecdote, and I thank you for sharing it. And that's, I, I've said it before, that's one of the great things about wrestling. You know, Bob Backlund comes to Binghamton, New York. <laughs> Same night, Andre the Giant comes to Binghamton, New York. Reggie Jackson and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar were not coming to Binghamton. That's these true. Guys that's true. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, wrestling was so, uh, was so unique in that regard, and uh, – it was just, it was just awesome, and, and you know, uh, another thing I'll, I'll add too, and more of a historical uh, uh, bent on the whole Bruno Zabisco thing. I think because the fans did believe, and they had seen the whole, you know, seven or eight year arc of their relationship, and then the blow up. Look at year two thousand WCW when they were really struggling. They they tried to redo the the Bruno Zabisco thing with. Uh, Billy Kidman, you know, this young, uh, hot commodity, young up and comer, he turns on Hulk Hogan. But the thing there is, you know, you would think it would have been a big box office deal, but there was no relationship between Billy Kidman and Hulk Hogan. There was no, you know, eight years or even two months of relationship there. So you can see why that kind of just fell on its face where something like this really had legs to it. You know, it's really one of the great pro wrestling uh, stories that can can never be told again. I mean, very similar to uh, Paul Jones turning on Ricky Steamboat, except it was the other way around. It was the teacher turning on the student when the student became better than the teacher. Then we move forward, Magnum TA and Mr. Wrestling 2. Mr. Wrestling 2 becomes incredibly jealous of his protege, Magnum TA, and th those two start feuding. And that was, in my opinion, the greatest wrestling feud of all time. It is available for you, to you, the viewer, to viewer, the listener yeah. to stick to wrestling, to watch on Peacock. It's all right there, and it is, it is fantastic storytelling. Well, John, uh, I think it's about time I hit you with a question here. So, okay, uh, let's 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 pick one. Pete Pingle asks, and I'll cut this down a little bit here. He says, um, first he said, "Great episode." Yeah, all right. <laughs> great episode. Yes, <laughs> and he says, uh, "I've always been stunned that Larry Zbysko never came back to the WWF. I just can't believe that whatever the issues that they had couldn't have been reconciled." They could have uh, went so many different ways to bring him back. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, John? I, I do have thoughts on this. And as a matter of fact, it, it ties into what I was just saying that Vince McMahon Sr. says, OK, you know, I gave this guy the, you know, the biggest angle, arguably in WWF history. I made him into the top heel um, that turned on Bruno. I'm getting my payoff out of this. OK, I'm mm -hmm. getting my Spectrum matches, my feud versus Korea, et cetera. What if Vince McMahon had decide, said to himself, and guess what? If I bring Larry Zbysko back fall of 1982, early 1983, I'm still getting my return on my investment after I put this kid in the freezer for two years, <laughs> uh, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, what if, what if Vince Sr. were to call Larry, or, or now Vince Jr. is running the show, uh, which you don't know what the dynamic is. If it's like, well, you know, he didn't screw me. I'm not going to worry about it. Or it's even worse. You screwed my dad. I'm going to, you know, I'm not forgetting this. But what if, you know, he called Larry and there, Steve, you know, there was money 
in a Larry Zabisco returns to the WWF late 82, early 83 scenario. There was money there. Okay. You know, what if he, he called Zabisco and said, look, you know, have you learned your lesson yet? Are you going to hold me up ever again? Uh, to me, I think there there should have been a reconciliation there because again, you know, it's it's like Michael Corleone said, it's just business, right? Um, well, I will tell you this: I, I do remember from uh, Meltzer and the Observer back then, uh, from my back issues, I went and got uh, basically uh, that period in '84 when Bruno uh, negotiated with Vince to come in. The original plan that supposedly Bruno had asked for, and, and of course it didn't work out this way, uh, uh, Bruno w- agreed to come in as an announcer and maybe wrestle part-time. He wanted David to come in with him. He wanted Dominic DiNucci to come in just to do prelims again. And supposedly he wanted Zabisco to come in and, and work in some capacity. Uh, both Zabisco and DiNucci got tossed to the wayside. They Neither one came in. Uh, so apparently the uh, McMahon's held strong to not bring him back. I mean, and he was literally never brought back. I mean, you know, that don't I, no one can tell me that late 1980s, early 1990s, WWF could not have used Larry Zabisco. And then especially in the Northeast, people were going to remember this guy. And, you know, Vince. Decades later, put put Larry Zabisco in the WWF Hall, WWE Hall of Fame, and you know, I guess a, a decades were enough time. But I, I had never heard that story about Bruno wanting to bring his whole crew in, and only uh, David was was getting the the invitation. Dominic Danucci was just way too old. Like if I'm Vince McMahon, yeah, right, I'm right. like, look, man, I, I I can't cave on that one. And I guess he must have said, you know, I can't cave on this Larry Zabisco thing. You know, he held up my dad at Shea Stadium and and I'm not forgetting. Yeah, yeah. The, the, they they held firm to that. All right, we've got another question from Rob Nelson. Should Larry Zabisco had been given a run as the WWF champion it's anecdote time, kids. And I'll, I'll give the name Moondog Spot. He's been gone. Uh, Larry Booker. He's been gone for like 20 years. So I feel like, okay, now I can tell the tale out of school. Larry told me that and he was around the WWF around this time that the plan was for the whole Bruno Zabisco thing to end up with Larry Zabisco as the babyface World Wrestling Federation champion after all of this. Steve, I'm sure you remember that at the end of the cage match at Shea Stadium, Bruno wins, and he wins by walking out the door, but he didn't win by running out the door, okay? He beat Mm -hmm. the crap out of Larry Zabisco, left him laying, kind of did that disgusted "Eh," thing with his arm, (laughs) and walks out of the cage, right? Right. Larry Zabisco at the end of the match tries to raise Bruno's hand. And that was supposed to be a big deal. And Bruno just let him do it really quickly and walked out. And I was told that this was all going to end with Larry Zabisco turning back baby face, you know, just saying, okay, Bruno, you know, you got, you're the better man, you won, and the two reconcile, and that Larry Zabisco was eventually going to become the babyface world wrestling federation champion now i don't know if this was true i had another wrestler who i'm actually going to let this guy remain unnamed say that the end result of this all was going to be david san martino becoming the wwf champion which steve you you understand you grew up around here Bruno San Martino was such a big deal that just putting his his less talented smaller kid in there was not an inconceivable thing but here are are two things that i was told that were supposed to spin out of the larry zabisco thing oh and and larry uh, booker told me that you know bob backlin got wind of this and he was not happy (laughs) well well my (laughs) those are very interesting anecdotes and and can i throw this in really quick everyone listening to what i just said Take it with a grain of salt. I am not saying that any of this is accurate. I'm just saying that that someone told me, two different people told me those two different scenarios. Okay. Well, with Zabisco, 
Well, let's go back to when Backlund became champion. I, I think basically the the elder McMahon said, uh, yeah, we're going to have you have a five year run with the belt. And, and they wanted to have a long term champion, much like Bruno had been a long term champion. So Backlund was deemed the one. And there was never, to my knowledge, there was never any real serious, serious discussion of, hey, let's put it on this guy for a few months and then we'll let Bobby win it back. I think that uh, McMahon was so happy with the performance of Backlund and Backlund did everything that he asked him to do. And he wasn't like Bruno or Billy Graham saying, hey, I need more money or I need this or that. He was just very easy and very uh, easy, easy to get along with and work with. He never asked for anything extra. So I don't think I don't think there was any real business need to switch the title off of him. I mean, maybe us as hardcore fans, we would have liked to have seen maybe another person in the mix. It would have been a little bit more exciting. And as far as the question, should Larry have been given a run? Maybe. But from the McMahon point of view, I could just see it as, why are we going to give this young prima donna the belt and then we'll have problems getting it off of him? Or, you know, I, I don't think. I don't think they wanted to He's reward got Bruno him. in his ear. Yeah, yeah. It was just it was just creating more more uh, drama, which the elder McMahon was thinking about his retirement and enjoying being in Fort Lauderdale. He wasn't cared about uh, drama in wrestling anymore. He was trying to have less drama in his life. That makes sense, especially you know my understanding is is Bob Backlund did well early in his run at Madison Square Garden, but he was spotty in places like Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Boston. The crowds were, they were not at a Bruno level. They eventually got there, but early in the game, they weren't there. But at the time frame we're looking at, I mean, Bob Backlund did really, really well at the gate, uh, just certainly during the second half or maybe even two thirds of his run as as WWF champion. So I'm like you, why is the WWF changing anything? They have a formula that works. They have the quiet, soft-spoken baby face, whether it be Bob Backlund or Bruno Sammartino, fighting the nuts that are controlled by Fred Blassie, Lou Albano, and the Grand Wizard. Well, well, transitioning from what you just said, uh, we do have a a question that's going to take us off the path a little bit, but I really like this question. David Ferguson asks, Ernie Roth should be in the Observer Hall of Fame, right? Can you make your case for him? I think Grand Wizard slash Ernie Roth is in that next category down where I, I think he was a great contributor but I don't. I, I think he's on that same level as Kerry Von Erich, Junkyard Dog. You know, just a great wrestler, a great contributor, but just not not Hall of Fame level. I mean, he's he's the next step down. He's like you know the Al Oliver of professional wrestling, <laughs> Cesar well, Cedeno. Well, that that's certainly uh, that's certainly a nice tribute there because those guys were great. Actually, this is one of the few guys I've really been pulling to see get into the Observer Hall of Fame. Look at the original, the original um, 1996 is when Dave had his first class. And I think the only managers that made that initial class were uh, Bobby Heenan and Jim Cornette, two great choices. But uh, Albano had to wait a number of years before he got in. Uh, Blassie did make it, of course, in the original just because it was based on his wrestling. But yes. uh, to to me, Ernie Roth, I mean, you know, any hardcore fan that knows about the territory days knows about the three wise men of the of the East or the North. And it's like these all three contributed greatly. Uh, I've said on the show before, I think Albano was the biggest heat generator of the, the three in the Northeast. But the wizard was always the one that was paired with the guys who were going for the gold. He, he got the more of the top singles guys and Albano got the tag guys and Blassie got the foreigners. But, uh, you know, between what he did here and what he did with the Sheik in Detroit, I mean, the Sheik didn't do any interviews. Uh, Abdullah Farouk did all the interviews and I think it was much better than the Eddie Creechman that followed him. Uh, oh yeah. And, and, and I Eddie have a, Creechman was not one of my favorites. And I have, I have a good buddy of mine, Bob, uh, that I grew up with uh, who hates wrestling or not hates wrestling, but isn't into, into it. But yeah, you know, the grand wizard was just, he just was enthralled by the grand wizard. I mean, this guy, a little diminutive guy in a fez and the, in the crazy glasses and wardrobe, uh, but he could talk with the best of them. So in my opinion, Hopefully one day he will make the Hall of Fame. I'm sure Brian Solomon would uh, 
would vouch for me on that one. I I agree with you. And he's one of those guys where if he got in, I would I wouldn't be like, you know, okay, that's a, that's a bad choice. I would not have done that. You know, mm-hmm. once again, same thing as Kerry Von Eric and Junkyard Dog. It's not like, you know, I'd have a fit over it like <laughs> I did with Harold Baines, but um <laughs> I, 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 I personally just w- w- I, I personally would not vote for any of those guys. But like I said, if if you or anyone else thinks they belong, I'm 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 not going to argue with you. There are some guys I will argue with you. Like, no, they're not a Hall of Famer. We were talking about this on the Facebook group. Someone was like, you know, I think Ole Anderson is an obvious Hall of Famer. I'm like, no way. And then <laughs> let, let me make up for that. I also came back with, but I do think. Oli and Gene Anderson absolutely belong in the Hall of Fame. If the Midnight Express, Rock and Roll Express, and the Assassins are in the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame, then then I think Oli and Gene absolutely belong in as, as a tag team. I agreed. I agree on that. Are the Freebirds in? Ah, oh, gee, I, I I think that they are in. I think they're in. I, I'm pretty sure they are. And you know, and once again, it. I'm not big into like you know, if person X is in the Hall of Fame, then person Y should be in the Hall of Fame. Like people are like, oh, Ricky Steamboat's in, so Junkyard Dog should be in. <laughs> right. Nope, Ricky Steamboat was an elite worker. That's why he was in. You know, that's just my opinion. But. Anyway, uh, let's go back to the questions. Uh, let me see. Jerry Joy, I like this question. Which non-WWF wrestler would you have brought in to challenge Bob Backlund for the world championship in a three to five? They didn't have five match series. They only had <laughs> one four match series. But, I mean, three match series at the time. The elite guys got three match series with Bob Backlund. And we're talking guys like Don Morocco, Stan Hansen, etc. Steve, is there anyone from that particular time frame who you would have brought in and been like, you know, okay, this guy is perfect for a big, big run against Bob Backlund. Well, when I heard the question, the first person I thought of was Terry Funk. And then I thought about it a little bit more and I thought about, well, maybe Bruiser Brody would be a great choice. But then I, I gave a little more thought. The, the person who I would pick above anybody else would be Nick Bockwinkle, along with hopefully along with Bobby Heenan, to challenge uh, Bobby uh, Bobby Backlund for the title, whether at the Garden. I know they had the one one or two matches in Toronto, but if they had a huge program in the Northeast. I think that would have been great. The reason I went with Bockwinkle over Brody or Terry, those two other guys are more like brawling guys. I know Terry could wrestle if he wanted to, but he was more in the brawling. Backlund is a brawler, not so much, but uh, Backlund wrestling, a, a real wrestler like a Bachwinkle, I think they could have put on a clinic that uh, probably, um, I know the Patterson uh, Backlund series was great at the Garden, but that this with the Bachwinkle probably would have exceeded it. I l- let me put some sprinkles on that Sunday for you. All right. Nick Bockwinkle was not the AWA champion uh, summer of 1980 until May 1981. Wow. So it's not like they couldn't have brought in Bockwinkle and Heenan as a package just for that, you know, typical six, seven month run that guys had. And, you know, occasionally fly back to do a taping for the AWA. But I mean, that absolutely could have worked. The only problem is. And I wouldn't have let this be a problem, but this is, you know, the wrestling business. Albano, Blassie, and Wizard would not have been happy with that scenario where you bring in Bobby Heenan and with his guy, and then when his guy leaves, he goes home. But, you know, too bad. You work for me, not the other way around. Right, right. And uh, to that point, um, I I think that's one of the reasons why Zabisco resonated so much. He didn't have a manager. He was his own mouthpiece. And that was so... Uh, you know, uncharacteristic of the WWF. Everybody had a mouth, mouthpiece who was a heel. So, but I want I want to have you answer that question. Uh, who who would have been your choice to have a, a run against Backlund? Yeah, you know, before I answer that, I'm, I'm, I'm like having this conversation in my head where, you know, Blassie bitches to Vince McMahon about, you know, bringing in Heenan. I would have been like, you son of a bitch, you have the most plumb job <laughs> in the wrestling business. <laughs> You, Wizard, and Albano, you show up at the tapings twice a month, and then you got to go to Madison Square Garden, and the rest of the time you sit at home, and you're going to talk to me about what? <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
They, they had the best jobs out there. They didn't have to go on the road like the rest of the guys, just show up for TV, show up at Madison Square Garden. That was one of my biggest surprises when I started going to the matches at the Boston Garden. Like, where is the Grand Wizard? Where is Captain Lou Albano? In front of his TV, that's where. <laughs> And they were supposed to bring in Terry Funk in 1980. Uh, I I have Terry Funk's book right in front of me. I I should look this up. Uh, I I can't stop the recording of the show. But I do know Terry Funk was supposed to come in in 1980. And I'm not sure what happened. But they were talking about it in the After Magazines. Terry Funk is on his way to the WWF. And I'm sitting there waiting for him to show up on TV. And he never did. Maybe Terry Funk was supposed to be Bob Backlund's uh, challenger at Shea Stadium, and that's why there was that that kind of gaping hole in the card. Well, I, I I might be in the minority, but I still like the idea of for one night only. Let's pair up Bob Backlund and Pedro Morales, kind of a dream team, two elite superstars going up against the Samoans who had never been beaten. I mean, I, I kind of like that as a special. Uh, you know, sprinkle on the Sunday of the supposed greatest card of all time. I, you know what? When I was a kid, I, I didn't like it. I mean, and I got WOR from New York, and I saw the Saturday Night Show, and I was like, you know, well, this is supposed to be a super card. You're not only supposed to be having Bob Backlund against an elite guy like an Ivan Koloff or a Terry Funk. <laughs> you should be bringing in Harley Race to defend his title as well. But then as time went on, I grew to understand that basically if you're doing that, you're taking eyeballs off the real story, which is which was Bruno San Martino against Larry Zabisco. Like right. that was your draw. The show did really well. I think it did like 30,000. Uh, so what, what, what do you, why are you fixing what, what, what's not broken? Well, I'm going to hit you with a question now. Uh, the uh, ever controversial Les Tackix asks, would Bruno putting Larry over have helped Zabisco's career? Would it have hurt Bruno's legacy? Uh, I don't think whether or not it hurt Bruno's legacy is the real – I don't think that's the real focal point. The real focal point to me, as someone who you know grew up in the WWF area, understanding what they were doing, the WWF, whether it be you know with Bruno as champion or with Backlund as champion or with Bruno seeking revenge upon the person who – this Judas who turned on him, you wanted to send the fans home happy. That's what made the WWF work. Maybe – you know, you weren't sent home happy the first two times Bruno and Zabisco fought at Madison Square Garden, but you were sent happy at the end when Bruno finally beats Larry Zabisco convincingly in that cage. And if to me, if you put Larry Zabisco over as the winner of this feud, I mean, you are you are beyond disappointing the the Bruno fans who were out there. I mean, Bruno, you, you know, Steve. I mean, Bruno, it was just he was like Roberto Clemente. He he was beyond this. The the Northeast took him in as more than just a pro wrestler. I mean, people lit, lit candles to the guy. Oh yeah, and, and I was one of the ones with the candles. So I'm there right you there go. with you. And you, you're absolutely right. I mean, I mean, here's the biggest show in the history of the promotion. Are they going to let the the bad guy win? Uh, obviously not. You know, and, and another thing, just to add to what you said, you know, Vince's the elder Vince's biggest fear was always to have a riot or have chaos emerge. Uh, you know, it, what what would have happened at Shea Stadium with thirty six thousand people if Larry wins the match? I mean, there could have been a potential for fans running on the field and going ape shit like uh, Bruno lost. Uh, I don't think so. And uh, there'd be a riot. <laughs> really? or, you know, so so thank God that didn't happen. Uh, but, I, you know, th- I did hear a Bruno shoot interview a long time ago. This might have been one with uh, Bill Apter or somebody. But he did say something to the effect of that the original plan was that Larry was going to win their feud or win the match. And that always kind of caught me off guard. But. You know, and after you and I and, of course, uh, Dr. Nick had talked about this uh, feud so much uh, over the past week, one thing I thought about was um, something you talked about a little bit earlier in the show. When uh, Larry lifted Bruno's arm after the cage match, you could see maybe a little inkling of a of a Larry turn back into a good guy again. And, you know, if I could have booked it maybe uh, knowing what we know now, 
uh, maybe a few weeks after the cage match, they could have had, uh, you know, one of those sit down interviews with maybe uh, Vince and Larry in an empty arena. And, and maybe Larry could have like spilled his guts and said, you know, I got t- too full of myself and uh, Bruno is the legend, uh, but maybe I could be the next best thing or se- second to Bruno or something. And then maybe they could have had an angle, some kind of an angle where, you know, like a Ken Patera injures Bruno or somebody injures Bruno and Larry comes in to save him. Something like that could have restored uh, Larry's uh, fan favorite uh, luster. But, uh, yeah, he was already out of the promotion by the time they were going to do all that. So it was just unfortunate that never happened for him. You know, getting back to Les's question, one thing you could have done with and let's say you put Zabisco over in this feud, right? Mm-hmm. You have Bruno or whoever, Bruno, get on TV and say, you know what? Father time remains undefeated. I was WWF champion back in the 60s, back in the 70s, and just father time has, remains undefeated. And I think it's time for me to hang it up now. And I say that because I remember September or late August uh, 1981, Bruno gets on TV, and this came out of nowhere for me. And he's dressed in his street clothes, and he's sitting down with Vince McMahon, and Bruno announces his retirement. And I was just stunned. I mean, I just thought we'd never see this day, even though the day was inevitable. Sure. And Bruno, he was just like, you know what? I, I feel like I'm still at the top of my game, but if I, I feel like if I hang around much longer, I'm going to have people saying, you know, yeah, he's he's good now, but you should have seen him back in the day. He's not what he once was. I, I never want to have that. And it, it just totally connected with me that, you know, Bruno was was going out on top. And, uh, you know, that's a, another way you could have done it. But I, I think at the end of the day, they did it the right way. Yeah, and I'm glad that Bruno kind of remained in that, uh, you know, special living legend realm of pretty much being undefeated except for the title losses that he had. I mean, um, you know, I guess some fans may have forgotten just how incredibly good the uh, short-lived Bruno against Piper feud was a few years later. I mean, Piper. Which I got to see live. I'm happy to report. Oh, awesome. Awesome. And, and, and I mean, the thing with Piper was, uh, you know, he had beaten Snuka. He was the legend killer. So now he's in the ring with the living legend and they're doing these live Piper's pit, one in Boston, one in New York. And, and those were extremely effective. And, and, and Piper was uh, very much like a Larry Zabisco just coming off as his young, arrogant punk. And Bruno was, of course, the uh, older, elder statesman of the promotion. And uh, and they had a lot of heat. And, and to a lesser extent, the Bruno Savage feud a few years after that was pretty good, too. Uh, so Bruno, uh, you really got to finish his career out as pretty much undefeated except for his title losses. But, uh, you know, I think just the love everybody has for Bruno, with the exception of the less tactics of the world, uh, you know, we just <laughs> enjoy Bruno. And uh, just, you know, for, for those of us that like him, it's probably the happiest thing in wrestling is being a fan of his. I, I promise I'm sticking to wrestling here, okay? I, I, everything I, I say is related to wrestling. I am a lifetime New England Patriots fan. I mean, going back to when we first moved up here from New York in 1975 and the Patriots played right up the street for me. And I had New England Patriots living amongst you know normal <laughs> people like me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, Horace Ivory was my next door neighbor one year. Okay. Uh, so I, I am a dedicated Patriots fan. And the Patriots finally made the Super Bowl in 1985. And we were all just living off that high. And they got destroyed in that Super Bowl. The final score was 46 to 10. It was not that close. That game was over before the first quarter was over, right? Mm-hmm. So right after this, it's Bruno Sammartino versus Roddy Piper in the cage of the Boston Garden. And Piper comes out first, and he starts hanging posters <laughs> of Jim McMahon and Refrigerator Perry and 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 uh, what's his name? Uh, why can't I remember Walton, Walter Payton's name? Thank you. He starts <laughs> hanging all these posters on the wall. I remember and that. And the walls of the cage and the place just goes nuts. It was a great memory. Yeah, yeah. And when Bruno came out, he basically shoved it right up uh, yes! behind. It was, it was incredible. 
<laughs> he put one of the posters down the back of Piper's trunks, and then one of the posters he tried to ram into his mouth. It was just a such a great night. Piper was so awesome. I want to read a question from Ron Wayne. You've mentioned many times on the show that the WWF under Vince Sr. would have maybe one angle a year on their syndicated TV in the 70s. I'm looking at the time frame. Bruno Lowry was less than six months after Valentine broke Strongbow's leg and about six months before Bob Backlund and Pedro Morales teamed up against the Samoans. Uh, it, it's also in the middle of this was Pat Patterson turning Ron. And he's like, you know, what what happened to the speed? You know, things started changing and more things started to happen on TV. Steve, I wanted to throw this out there because the WWF, they, they didn't have very many angles on TV during the Bob Backlund era, d- during the Bruno San Martino era. But what they did have, and I'm sure you can relate to this, were angles that happened at the arena. And they relied on this at the Boston Garden where, you know, Adrian Adonis would attack Bob Backlund with that belt that he wore around his his neck around the ring and the neck and Backlund would steal it from him and he'd be whipping Adrian Adonis and Adonis would run to the back and then Bob Backlund comes out the next month for the rematch and he's got his jacket on and he takes the jacket off and he's got that belt around his neck <laughs> and the place goes crazy and so does Adrian Adonis and Backlund goes over and you know wraps it around Adonis's neck and starts throwing him around I mean that's the way the WWF ran it wasn't just you know what you saw on TV, if you were getting WOR and cable, and if you lived in Iowa or Indiana or something, unfortunately, you just weren't give, getting the whole story because a lot of it happened before your own eyes and the eyes of, you know, 14, 15,000 people at your local big arena. Yeah, yeah. And I, I've listened to this show um, before I was on it. I've listened to your comments and and I've I've always kind of taken your comments with a grain of salt that they would only do like one or two major angles a year. Uh, you know, they did. They That's did. a bit of an ex- exaggeration. Yeah, they did, yeah, two, yeah. They, they, they did. They did more than that. But but as as far as like a major, major, like to say the Bruno Larry one. Yeah, that was definitely the most major we had seen in, in many a year. Yeah, I would say 1980 was really a magical year for WWF wrestling. I mean, I think maybe the year before that that was the most monumental was either 76 with the Bruno broken neck or 77 with a superstar winning the title. Those were huge years. But in 80, you had the emergence of Hulk Hogan against Andre, the Bruno feud with Larry. Uh, Backlund had a Harley race and a whole bunch of new challengers. Great series with Patera, uh, won the Rest- Wrestling Observer match of the year. The Bruno Zabisco feud won feud of the year in the Observer. So, and the Samoans were undefeated. I mean, it was just a massive year for the WWF, one of their best years. And uh, I think it was probably, um, you know, until expansion happened, it was probably their last major, major year under uh, the Elder McMahon. Well, a couple of things. Number one, it was it was a very different year. I mean, you had Bob Backlund against Samoan uh, defending the title against Samoan Afa and Samoan Sika when Bruno San Martino and Larry Zbyszko were on top at Madison Square Garden. You know, very rarely did you have the champion not defending the, the title in the main event. And secondly, I mean, Backlund's Madison Square Garden title defenses were all over the place. They had Backlund versus Patera in January and February, and then they had Backlund against the two Samoans, and then they brought Backlund versus Patera back three months later, which was unheard of. Then they do Backlund versus Zabisco when they've already announced the Shea Stadium show, and Zabisco wins by countout, and they never do a rematch. So they were doing things way differently than they normally did. And, you know, they're... There's that old expression about, you know, one one person's playing checkers while the other person is playing chess. You watch Florida Championship Wrestling, Mid-South Wrestling. These guys were playing chess. I mean, the WWF wasn't even playing checkers. They were playing tic-tac-toe, but it didn't <laughs> matter. They kept it simple and it worked. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, yeah, I think you're referring to the work rate. Is that what you're referring to? 
No, the the whole they they just kept it all very simple. They didn't make you focus on a number of different things. They kept you more or less focused on one thing, whether it be, you know, Bob Backlund defending the title against this really really bad bad guy, and then you have that like dis- that lesser feud underneath Strongbow Valentine or Morales versus Morocco, whatever you got. Shea Stadium, you've got Hulk Hogan versus Andre the giant after hulk hogan busted andre open on television so you know but but they kept it simple you know you didn't have to focus on one of bill watts's really complicated storylines and when i say that i say it in a complimentary manner i mean you know that you had to keep your eyes open watching mid-south wrestling it was like watching an episode of breaking bad you know but i mean (laughs) vince you know vince the mcmahon's didn't want breaking bad they wanted happy days and it worked yeah, it was a very simple formula. Uh, tying in w- with what you just said about the Samoans getting title matches at MSG, Aaron Cushman had asked, uh, did you happen to catch any of the championship wrestling episodes with the Ox Baker squash matches? If so, what did you think? I have not watched the championship wrestling episodes with Ox Baker. I do have, have had some of the Ox Baker matches from the WWF. I mean, I had them on VHS back in 87, 88. And I watched them fairly recently, like maybe 10, 15 years ago. And I've always maintained that no, Ox Baker was not a good worker. Ox Baker, you know, but he was a big guy and he wasn't so bad that he, at least in the WWF to me, he wasn't so bad that he stuck out as, you know, someone you need to get rid of. Um, I, I said this on the show, like, I mean, literally three, four, maybe even five years ago. Steve, you had mentioned why Gino Hernandez did not last in the WWF. I think I, I'm theorizing that Ox Baker didn't last in the WWF for similar reasons, because if Ox Baker is in the room, you're going to know if you're within 20 feet of Ox Baker, you're (laughs) going to know he's around. I've been around Ox Baker. That's just who he was. And I I have the feeling that, you know, they could have done Bob Backlund versus Ox Baker one and done, and then done Andre versus Ox Baker one and done. And they would have, you know, they would have more than gotten away with it. I don't think anyone would have noticed that Ox wasn't a a great in-ring technician. Well, I I did notice, I did watch uh, actually one of the matches on Championship Wrestling on the network. uh, I think it was from mid-April. There is an Ox Baker squash against... uh, Angelo Gomez, I believe, uh, uh, or no, Steve King. Steve King. Okay, I've seen that one. And the match is the match was was not as bad as I was kind of expecting it to be. Along with you, I agree. I think he would have been passable. I think he would have been in that kind of a, a sweet Hanson type of a challenger, a one and done. But um, but I, I don't think it would have been as as bad as the like a mighty Joe, <laughs> mighty Joe Thunder against uh, Backlund could have been. Okay, Mighty Joe Thunder stood out. <laughs> Ox Baker did not stand out. I did not see anything wrong with you know that wrong with Ox Baker. And again, it's 1980. It's a year the year after you had Bob Backlund versus Bulldog Brower at right. Madison Square Garden. And this was not young Bulldog Brower, okay? This was a fat old man. And then you had the Swede Hansen match. Ox Baker was, you know, Ox Baker was better than Bulldog Brower, and he was certainly no worse than Swede Hansen. So that's always been my theory, is that Ox just didn't fit in in the dressing room, and they just said, all right, we don't need this guy. That's probably true. Uh, do you have a question for me? Uh, you know what? We're running out of time, but I do have one more question. There was one more thing I absolutely wanted to talk about. Where is that? Uh, Mark Rock and Roland asked, not not really a question, but should Larry have had the Intercontinental Championship run or found a tag team partner to have a tag team title run during this time frame? I'll tell you, I'll hand this over to Steve in, in just a moment. But Mark, in the, the old WWF, the tag team championship was not a money spot. And I think Larry would have wanted a, a money spot. Had they brought Zabisco back in, you know, like I keep saying, late 82, maybe even mid 82, and put the Intercontinental Championship on him as kind of a, yeah, take this guy seriously, I think that would have been 
a, a nice addition, a nice way to put Zabisco over. And frankly, I, I, I've never under, I've never agreed with the old kind of a cliche that wrestler X didn't need a title to get over. Okay, Bruno, I guess Bruno and Hogan and Flair just needed those titles. No, they were <laughs> the best choices for champions. But I didn't think Morocco needed a second run with the Intercontinental Championship. I, I you know, I, it worked, but I mean, it's just not the way I would I would have booked it. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree with John's thinking. I mean, if Larry was to have stuck around, having him be an IC title champion would have made a lot of sense. I mean, this is not really answering the question too much, but I would say where I think the WWF missed the boat on using Larry Zbysko in the future, uh, had they allowed him to come back, say, in the mid-'80s, you know, when the, when the WWF was thriving with Piper's Pit, when that was like the hot thing on the A show on the superstars or championship wrestling, I think, uh, I think a Larry Zabisco's, uh, you know, Spudhead Nation or something like that, <laughs> you know, his own little show on uh, maybe wrestling challenge or all star wrestling would have been great. Uh, I, you know, he really did fit in better with the WWF style as far as, uh, you know, it wasn't heavy on the ring work. He was good wrestling, but he was, you know, a great staller, as everybody likes to remind us. A, good, a really good talker, though. And uh, and I really enjoyed him on the AWA when he did a lot of uh, – he did some color commentating when he was the champ. And, of course, he did a lot of that in WCW. He was just a good kind of a wise guy, uh, kind of, um, you know, funny on commentary the way a Johnny V would be. But – um he just burned some bridges with Vince Sr. and and I I just think he just kind of uh, self sabotaged his own career with with some bad advice from Bruno playing a role in that too. Yeah, I I am just more inclined to think that Larry Zabisco was the the victim of poor timing as it was because I you know I just think that. I mean, we know that Vince Jr. took over uh, June 1982, which was right around the time you want you would think about bringing Larry Zbysko back. And I'm sure you know, it, it, I'm sure it was very personal for Vince Jr. Like, okay, I can live with you screwing me, and maybe my dad could live with you screwing him, but I can't live with you screwing my dad. You're not coming back. I really believe that's what happened. Yeah. Well, hey, John, I want to hit you with a question that isn't on the list, and we didn't talk about this in advance, but... Pop quiz! I'll make this very brief, but I think you'll do great with the question. It's been rumored and reported, and I think we, we may have talked about this online many, many, many months ago, but either in the late 80s or early 90s, when WCW was doing everything within their power to get a foothold in New York, there were rumors that... Uh, they were going to somehow resuscitate the Bruno Zabisco feud. And this is maybe two or three years after Bruno's actual retirement match, but they were going to bring them back uh, probably at the Meadowlands or some arena in, in New York. Now it, we, we know it wasn't going to be Frampton comes alive uh, too, uh, but it, what, what would be your take if they tried to resuscitate that feud all those years later? Well, they did. And they kept coming up with scenarios like Bruno was just like, I'm not wrestling again. I'm not wrestling again. Well, until he wrestled again in like 85. But, you know, during this time frame, you know, Bruno was just like, you know, I'm not doing it. I'm done. And they they would come up with ideas like, OK, well, maybe have Bruno get attacked by Zabisco and have David San Martino be the one you know, seeking revenge. I mean, they, you know, they wanted to do that in Georgia and mm -hmm. Bruno supposedly wouldn't have it. But, you know, it, I think when it turned out, like Bruno was not doing a return to the ring to, to go at it with Zabisco again. He just, you know, and Bruno's kid versus Larry Zabisco just was not, it was Bruno's kid. It wasn't Bruno. It, it just, it wasn't enough. And again, I go back to, you know, having Bruno's kid against Larry Zabisco in Nashua, New Hampshire, and they were pushing it hard on their television and they couldn't even fill the front row around, around the ring. So I think that was just the missing thing. You know, there were, it was Bruno, no exceptions, no substitutions. And supposedly, just to get Bruno to, to do things like be the special guest referee at Halloween Havoc 89 took a lot of money and a lot of coaxing. Right, right. No, that, that's a great answer. Uh, yeah, WCW was just having so much difficulty getting into New York. I mean, they try to get Lawrence Taylor to do shows and they try to do every, everything under the sun. It's interesting that they 
did try to bring the feud back, and I know they talked about it a lot. Uh, but um, yeah, I think it was a, a nice little recap that we did on such a popular episode that we had had from last week. No, I, I agree. And like I said, it was one of my favorite episodes. And I think this this week's was an excellent episode as well. Steve, I'm going to leave you with something not sticking to wrestling. I will either be right or wrong when this comes out on Friday because the game will be long over. But my prediction is the Buffalo Bills destroy the Cincinnati Bengals today. The Bengals line stinks and they're, they stink when they're a hundred percent. They're not a hundred percent. The Bills play some savage defense. I'm looking for a Bills blowout today. You're not as big a football guy as I am. Well, I'm a big football guy. I mean, my, right. my 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 two teams, Tampa and the Giants, both really uh, really you know, play terrible. But uh, I think uh, San Francisco and uh, I mean, I lo- I like the Bengals. I like the uh, Bills a lot. I think I'm going to go with the Bengals just to surprise them. All right, and, and you never know. I mean, I've been wrong before, especially with those damn Giants of yours with the guy <laughs> catching the ball with his head and stealing our. <laughs> Super Bowl like 12 years ago. That wasn't fun. <laughs> right, right. And Tom Brady, like like uh, the way Anton Seguir got hit at the end of No Country for Old Men over and over again. <laughs> well, uh, let's, let's enjoy the games. That up, Steve. I really appreciate it. I'm just going to go sit in the corner and cry now. <laughs> <laughs> same here. Same here. <laughs> All right. I want to thank Steve Generelli for being our, the gracious occasional co-host here on Stick to Wrestling. We hope to have him back next week, and, and we hope to have him usually here. I want to thank Brian Lash for giving us this forum. I want to thank Lou Kippelman for all the great work he does, not only producing this show, but you know, being very flexible when it comes to time and being just very agreeable and just an overall great guy. Thank you, Lou. We'll see you all next week. Thank you for listening. This has been a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. This concludes our podcast day.